For those who are visiting, I hope you like to eat because they're going to be doing barbecue afterwards and plenty of food. Encourage you to stay and, and enjoy the fellowship. Um, and please stay because I don't want leftovers at my home for the next. You got the picture. You know how that works. If you have your Bibles, please open with me to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Now, if you remember last week, we were, um, the message was how a, a wife can win her husband. Now, we've been in a, a series, and even though I haven't called it a series, but dealing with submission. Most of us don't like that word, submission. Most of us, I think all of us, are probably a rebel at heart. Would you agree? Yeah, you know, somebody says, well, do this. What are you telling me to do this? Who are you? But we do that even with God, sadly. And so we were learning that this passage last week, verses 1 through 6, is how to a wife who is a believing wife can, again, or a, win her husband to the Lord. That means bring him into the kingdom by her actions, by her loving submission. But let me clarify again. Is not submitting to abusive husband who physically strikes a woman. And even verbal abusage, whether it be a man or a woman that is continually ongoing day in and day out, that is sin. And sometimes that can be detrimental to a person and changing their character radically. And after a while, they begin to think, I deserve this. We're not talking about submission to those things as we've been going through. But submitting in godliness to godly things and morals and how our actions can win people to the Lord. The greatest message that you could ever speak to the world is how you live your life. Because that opens the door when you do share with people to speak the truth in love. We're going to see later on that we need to be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within. Because they've been watching us. Now, this week we come again, just one verse for the men. And there were six verses for the women. Oh, you know those women, you know, they need the six verse. And that's not what it's teaching. Again, remember the context of the passage is teaching how to win a believing spouse to win their spouse to the Lord. And our part, and we have a part of that. Now, when we come to, again, this verse, I'll read it, and then we'll talk about it, and it's verse Peter 3, 7. You husbands... In the same way, the same way the women are, the wives are. Live with your wives in an understanding way as someone weaker since she is a woman. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so your prayers will not be hindered. Men, there is a greater responsibility on you than on the women. You are to be the leader in the family. Not just the breadwinner. And sometimes the woman is a breadwinner. But you are to be that spiritual leader leading your wife, your family into the arms of Jesus. You're to be that example to them. You're to demonstrate that love of Christ. And there's no greater love we've talked about than one who would lay down his life, just as Jesus did for the church. You're to lay down your life for your wife, for your family. So the responsibility we're going to see is, is greater on you and me. And it's not the amount of verses. It's just as important the text. In fact, it's more important. 
So Peter's turning to the husbands in this case. The exhortation certainly is much briefer. But again, not any less important. The fact is, there's a greater responsibility laid upon the husband. And he uses this phrase, did you notice, in the same way. Another translation may, might say likewise. There's many ways to, to say that. It means after the same manner, in the similar way. Wives are to be submissive to their husbands, but husbands, you're to be submissive to your wives as well. And see, here's an important point is, husbands and wives are to be one. Just as you and I are here today to worship God, we're one heart, one mind, and one spirit. As a family, as a husband, a wife, and even kids, you're to be one in every way. Your actions can divide, prevent what God wants to do. In this case, the husband is, again, when he's to submit, he's to submit to God's plan. You know your wife is your perfect wife? And what do you mean she's the perfect wife, some might say? Wives, the husband, oh, he's the perfect husband for you. What I mean by that, that you bring out the best in each one and you bring out the worst. Hmm. Is it good to bring out the worst in you? I think so sometimes. My, my wife knows how to bring out the worst in me. And you know what? I might not recognize this is something in my life that needs to change. All things, as the scripture says, work for the good for those who love the Lord and call according to his purpose. There's a part that she plays and there's a part that I play. She's submitting to God's plan and you need to submit to God's plan as well. Here, he gives clear instructions how to treat your wives. The husband is just as duty-bound to fulfill a particular role in the marriage. In fact, it's an obligation unto the Lord. Now, as the wife fulfills her duty, that must be acknowledged as well. So let's look at the verse, unpack it, look at it in more detail. Again, verse 7 you husbands in the same way. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Wives don't say, now listen up, guys. That's inappropriate. And I've been taught this passage where they're nudging them. No. I'm going to speak to the men, but I'm also going to add some things to the women because you guys are one. And this is important that you decide that you are married in Christ. And it's no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. And he will give you the love to love your wife. Ladies, he'll give you the grace to submit to your husband. And both, you can do this, but both have to choose to work together. A house divided against itself will not stand. And I've seen it go on for years and years and years where one or, or both are tearing at each other. And if you're in that situation, I'm going to say you have to make a decision today. Are you going to be married? Are you going to honor God? Because to torment each other is not good. It does not glorify God. To torment your kids when the parents are fine, that does not glorify God. Now notice the word, the word live. It conveys this idea of, of to dwell with or dwell in togetherness. So I'm going to add this, to together in oneness. You know, Wives, you are the helpmate. We'll talk about this more later. Guys, she's your helper. You are not complete without her. Now, God has given some the gift of singleness. Again, she'll, she'll bring out the best. She'll bring out the worst. 
but she is going to stand with you no matter what if you treat her the way that God would have you treat her. So you're to dwell with her. In togetherness and oneness expresses the ideas of living with someone in intimacy. And I'm not talking about a, a physical intimacy. That is true, too. But where you know one another. Know what makes one tick and what drives them over the edge. To know them. To know what makes them happy. You're reading something and know, oh gosh, they would love to read this. They would enjoy this. So there's this oneness. Husbands dwelling with your wives, it's, it's more than sharing the same address. It, it's, it, it's more than being a roommate. And sometimes that's what marriage is reduced to, just being roommates. Just having the same address. Sleeping in the same bed together. But yet not one unit. Not one in heart and mind and realizing that together it, it takes two of you really to glorify God, to fulfill what you're called to do. Wives, you are, as, and I'm speaking about a believing husband here, and wives believing, your goal should be to help your husband become everything that God would have him be. And husbands, also, your responsibility is to help your wife become everything that God would have her be. It's not just coming and taking. It's giving, and you've heard me say that biblical Christianity boils down to it's giving yourself first to God and then giving yourself to others. Proverbs 21, verse 9 says this, it's better to live in a corner of a roof than, to, than in a house shared with a contentious woman. In some, some houses, that's exactly what it is. And men, you're still to love your wife as Christ loves the church. Sometimes we're very contentious with the Lord. Sometimes we grumble. Not you guys, I understand. But we grumble and murmur at God and complain about our circumstances, the wife, the husband, whatever it would be. It's natural for the old man to do these things. It ought not be. We've forgotten the very purpose of a, a marriage. Let me read from Genesis. Genesis 2, verse 21 through 25. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man, and he slept. And then he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned it into a woman, the rib which he had taken from man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now the bone of my bones and the flesh of my flesh. And she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, this is an important passage. It's, it's a message that some, I use when I'm marrying people. She's taken from the man's side to be at his side. She's not taken from the side to tower over him or either way to walk upon, but to be on the side, a companion, to be one in every way. And, and oftentimes after the honeymoon's over, people forget these things. They know these things. Well, it continues. Notice in verse 24 of that, it says, For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and they be joined as one. They shall become one flesh. And man and his wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. Not only one in flesh, I'm going to add, because we pull it together in other places, one in flesh, one in mind, one in soul, and one in heart. It is wonderful to see a husband and a wife, when possible, worshiping together, and kids worshiping together. God has made us to worship him, not just in song, but serving him, living for him. This is what's important. This is, this is how you are made and for the purpose of being made. Now, let me go to Philippians, though. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 3. Again, this is kind of against the mission, but this is really talking about Christ, but I'm going to apply it 
to ourselves in the end. Paul writing, he says, therefore, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and compassion make my joy complete by being the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfish and empty conceit, but in humility of mind regard one another more important than yourselves. You're not a marriage where to esteem whether more important than yourself. We're going to talk about the beauty of your wife in a moment. But we're to have this same mind. We're, we're here on this earth to glorify God, to bring glory to him, to live a life, again, to be a light unto the world, a witness. And when we keep ourselves together in the love of God, we experience the abundant life that God wants for you. God wants you to walk in the abundance of his life. He wants you to walk right in the middle of his will or what we call the love of God Jude talks about. Now, many couples get their mail at the same mailbox, but they really don't dwell together. Too many husbands look at home as just a place to eat, get their clothes washed, and as soon as they get home, head to be with the guys all night. Hardy, hardy, just drink and pound it down. And home is much more than that, guys. Dinner comes, they pound it down, then they pile up on the couch, and that's it. And they're to dwell in this oneness, to be concerned about their spouse, and this is where they often miss it. And dwelling with her wife, it goes on in verse 7. You'll see that word understanding. We're to dwell with them according to understanding. There was a book written many years ago. It's about that thick, huge book. Anyone want to read that many pages? And it was written, everything that I learned about my wife. You open up, it's all blank pages. And we laugh at that, but we never take the time to come to know our wives. We never hang around long enough to know what makes them tick. We just react. And oftentimes that's what they do. They react to our reaction. We wonder why are things the way they are. Well, it is two sides. Both sides are to, to work together. But we've got to remember there's a, a oneness. Sometimes you have to take the, everything that you've got together, you've established this marriage, and it is a wreck. And you've got to knock everything down, and you need to build a new foundation, and it needs to be on Christ Jesus, on the principles of Christ. And if you're willing to do that, when I counsel people, I say, are you willing to do whatever it takes to make the marriage work? And they say, no, it's the end of the counseling. Because all I have is the Bible. If you're willing to do what the Bible says, you can have a good marriage. I understand it takes two. But men, you need to be everything that God would have you be. You need to be that witness. You need, again, to dwell with her. You need to understand her. You need to take time with her. You need to make her feel important and safe in your love. Not only does this refer to understanding God's plan for the home, God has a special and unique plan for the home. But it speaks of the knowledge of your wife. I've been married... 50 years. There's things that I still don't know about my wife. But all this time I'm learning and learning and learning. And I'm sure there's things in my life that she still hasn't come down. There's a lot of things she knows. But if we're honest, we're really 
complicated, all of us, aren't we? We kind of hold back and reserve because of body language and actions. Sometimes we want to share with one another and, and, and somebody looks a certain way and we kind of pull back. But we should keep pressing on. See, this knowledge that it, it speaks of is that we're to dwell with her wife and to know her, know her desires, know her goals, know her frustrations, her weaknesses, her strengths, emotionally and spiritually. Remember, she was taken from your side, and guys, where to take care of them, where to nurture them when they have hard times. In my life, I've had hard times, and my wife is there to nurture me. Because we're one. But it's a choice that we make each and every day, and sometimes from situation to situation. Please understand this isn't something as an academic knowledge. It's a deep understanding of your wife's heart. And your prayer life should be, Lord, help me to know my wife as you know her. I know you love her. Help me to know the beauty of her, not the negative. You'll know that. Help me to know how to please her and honor her and, and, and lift her up to you. A reporter once asked Mrs. Albert Einstein if she understood Dr. Einstein's theory of relativity. And she replied somewhat of a twinkle in her eye, I, I, I don't understand his theory, but I do understand the doctor. Do you understand your wife? Guys, that takes time. It takes a tenderness and a compassion. It takes a desire to just to want to know. That she knows she's important. She knows that she can trust you. And the question then is, can she trust you? Remember when I read earlier and they were naked and they were not ashamed. They trusted each other. In marriages, I can't live without you. I need, to, I need you in my life, but we can't trust one another. And you'll never understand the, the knowledge, the intimacy until you learn to trust one another. So the idea here is Peter is saying, you need to get to know your wife. In an understanding of her wives. You know, when you were dating before, you were dating, wanting to get to know her. And then we don't want to be with them. Well, to, to be with them is to know them. To explore and share things together. And it takes time. And you have to de decide, I'm going to put this time aside. I, I'm going to mark this on my calendar and not get anything in the way of this. There's also a, a difference that must be accepted. First Peter, again, chapter 3, verse 7, live with your wives in an understanding way. And there's three thoughts that are communicated in this passage I want to call your attention to. And the first one is that word show, if you look in your own text. Show. The, the word show means to, to give or deliver or a, a portion to bestow. The idea is, is giving a, a, a free gift. Give them honor. Show them honor. And this is sometimes that men, well, they know I love them. I come home. I give them my clothes to wash. I eat the food and never complain. I tell them I love them. But it's showing that love, showing that understanding that's important. And sadly, too many have an attitude that, that they don't honor their wives. 
only if their own demands are filled. If they do what you tell them to do, then, then I'll honor them. We're to honor them. And I'll get to this in a second because they're precious. You like that word, precious? Do we really value our wives? When we think about this, uh, there's a, a breakdown. It's a big thing in this world today, a leadership role of a husband. There's a, instead of leading her, not driving her, but leading her, today we hold them hostage sometimes to get our demands met. You're, you're not meeting my needs. Hopefully you've never said that. They're not there to meet your needs, and you're not there to meet their needs. Christ is the one that will meet your needs. When your relationship is right with Christ, then that relationship will be right with others. And this is very important to understand. Is it right with Christ? He will give you the grace. He will teach you how to love and understand the fact is that a husband is to freely give honor to his wife, whether or not she deserves it. How do you like that? Whether you walk in the door and she's grumbling or still in her bedroom clothes 12 hours later, eating chocolate balls and drooling down. I know I'm trying to lighten it up a little bit but you're still to honor her. She's your wife, and she is precious. And you have to decide, is she really precious in your eyes? The Bible is very clear. A godly woman, a godly wife, is a gift from God. Years ago, my daughter said to this lady that was in the church at the time, and her, husband. She loved her husband and, and she says, when I grow up, I want to have a, a husband just like him. And she said, honey, they don't come that way. You got to make them. <laughs> no, that's not true. But as you hold your wife up to Christ, as you pray for her, as you treat her as she's precious and valuable, she will blossom. She'll fill the house with fragrance. So the word honor, it means to think is precious. Holding her in high esteem. Proverbs 18.22 says this, He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Ladies, you're not just a good thing, you're precious, but that's just the way it comes across in her English. And obtains favor from the Lord. Husbands, you have a wife because God has favored you. The word favored, it gives the idea of grace. God has graciously given you that special, precious wife. In your actions will make it better or make it worse. You cannot point your finger at anyone else. It starts with me. It starts with you. Well, the third thing I want to call your attention to, it. forgive me, ladies, give me a chance. It, it, it says she's the weaker one. <laughs> and usually I see... Women sometimes stiffen up. What do you mean, weaker one? What do you mean by that? See, if we focus on one thing and we don't hear what the text is saying, we miss the main point. What does Peter mean by a woman being the, someone weaker? He, Peter doesn't mean that she's weaker spiritually. I've often found that women are more spiritual than men. 
They spend more time in prayer and studying and reading, drawing close and trusting in the Lord. My pastor, where I got saved, told me the story one time. He was frustrated. He was in the car, and the car wouldn't start. Anyone ever have that problem? And he's getting more frustrated trying to crank it over, and she's, she reaches over, puts her hand on him, says, Honey, did you pray? And he lashes out. He's a pastor, remember. What do you mean pray? It's a car. She says, Honey, let's pray. She prayed. The car started. I've heard God speak more clearly through women sometimes than men. Men struggle with pride more than women. Women, yeah, there's women that struggle with pride too. Certainly Peter doesn't mean weaker intellectually. You remember when you were in school and test is coming up and Everyone's looking at how they did on their test. It was all the girls that were at the top, had the high scores, the guys down at the bottom. He's not talking about that. So then what, is, what does Peter really mean? The word wife tells us exactly what it means. The word Translated wife is, is not from exact same word that Peter uses elsewhere in a text, but she's feminine. She's soft. She's tender. She's more caring. Oftentimes she's more understanding. Not always. But there's something different about a woman, and you could add to that list. It makes them special. So it's not derogatory when he says that. It's, it's to understand they're different. They have what you don't have. And as you two walk together in harmony, walk in the love of God, that you'll take on those traits. You will learn from her, and she will learn from you. But are they learning the good traits? Or the bad traits? What camp are you in? When, when you choose to do it God's way, you will grow closer and closer to each other as you grow closer and closer to God. But the choice begins with you. The idea is that she is delicate. I've known women that could throw their husbands across the room, and that doesn't sound delicate. But you know what I mean, delicate. They're just different, built different. The idea here is not to say that she's less valuable, but when something is delicate, there's generally a great value put upon it. And she's very valuable. She's precious and she's valuable. Guys, you need to recognize it. Because she's added so much. If she's a woman seeking after God with all of her heart and mind and soul strength, she will add value to your life. She will add value to your marriage. She will add value to your kids. I look back as my kids are growing, and I am so thankful for the influence, not that I didn't have influence, but the influence of my wife, in the lives of those kids and still influence in a way that, guys, we can't be. So the idea is she's valuable. Husbands, we're to honor our wives because of their great value. I like what Kent, our Kent Hughes says. The man who sanctifies his wife understands that this is divinely ordained responsibility. Is my wife more like Christ because she is married to me? Or is she 
like Christ in spite of me? Has she shrunk from the likeness because of me? Or do I sanctify her and hold her back? Is she a better woman because she's married to me? Those are good questions, good thoughts, men. See, where to be those godly leaders? Any man that puts God first in his life, that's seeking him with all of his heart, mind, and soul, and strength, that's willing to lay down his life. Follow these principles as we're talking. Be understanding and show them honor and value. Treat them as their precious. No woman would have a hard time submitting to their husband. And remember when we talked about submission last week, women? If for the women, it's voluntarily. Men, you can't force them to submit. That's not what the Bible teaches. And what they'll do is submit to you voluntarily, gladly, because they see Christ in you. The thought Peter is trying to get across here is that, that they're more expensive. They're valuable vessels. They're more delicate. They're fragile. Your wives, they are delicate. They are a priceless work. They're called by God. And we're going to see in a moment, they're fellow heirs to the kingdom of God. Look again in verse 7. Show her honor as a fellow heir of grace of life. Equal. Fellow heir. Sometimes husbands look down. Sometimes wives look down too. But if we're one, the goal is to help lift your husband up and help lift your wife up into the presence of God. Now this very thought that he says that they're fellow heirs of the grace of God, this was radical thinking in Peter's time. Wives at that time were looked at possessions, objects, there only to satisfy my needs. And, and those that are still living thousands of years later, they've just hung on to something in the past that's not biblically right. Jesus set women free. Free to, to love him and worship him and to love their husbands and worship him. 99% of the men of that day would not agree with Peter. But remember, this is the inspired word of God. God put the words in his mouth and his heart, and he was moved by the Holy Spirit to write these things out. You can argue all day, but it's still God's word. Please remember, in Peter's culture, the idea of a woman is, is not again, being spiritually equal to a man, it, it was totally unacceptable. In fact, being heirs was off the chart. Don't even talk to him. Again, it was in secular history, it reminds us that the, the Greeks and the Romans would never allow a woman to worship with men. Later on in the church, he had men one side and women on another side. Orthodox synagogues, Women had no place in the synagogue at all. So this radical teaching, freeing of women and teaching men to see their wives as precious and valuable. In the Muslim culture, women still are not allowed to worship with men separated from the center of the mosque, but still within the mosque, but they can't get close. Peter simply does away with this nonsense. And it is nonsense for the man that wants to talk down to a woman, make his demands. You meet my demands and I'll do that.
This is a startling statement when you think about it. A.W. Tozer says this, I suppose there are many Christian husbands whose prayers are not being answered. And they can think up of a lot of reasons why. But continuing in, in verse 7, it says so that your prayers will not be hindered. So you, you're to do all these things, and if you don't, then, then your prayers are hindered. How many want their prayers answered? Anyone? I guess you guys don't want your prayers answered. Come on, play along. You know, the thing is that if we want our prayers answered, do it God's way. God wants the best for you. He wants you to experience all that he has for you. But sometimes we just come to Christ and say, well, I said a sinner's prayer, going to heaven. And there's no change in life. Well, they may deceive themselves. Because unless a person's born again, they will not enter the kingdom of God. And there's a change in their hearts. They'll have a sincere desire for the milk of the word. And they will begin treating their wives so different. And wives will treat their husbands differently. Fact is, thoughtless husbands are simply big in their own eyes. In God's eyes, they're in rebellion to him. But if a husband gets, again, himself straightened out in his own mind and spirit, he begins to live with his wife in, in according to knowledge. He then begins to treat this this weaker, delicate vessel, protect her, hold her close and dear. Remember it at the same time, she's actually his sister in Christ. His prayers will be answered in spite of the devil. Doesn't matter all the reasons they say his prayers will not be answered unless he's willing to do it God's way. Let me remind you of a few more verses. We're coming to the end. In Genesis 1, verse 27, God created man in his own image. The image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them equal. It's in Genesis 2.20. Man gave the names to the cattle, to the birds of the sky, and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. God knowing man's needs, again, as we talked about this briefly, provided woman, a companion. Now, sometimes people are married a long time, a divorce, a death, and, and they fulfilled that purpose. And now God has a purpose of singleness, and there's a, 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 a time that God's going to teach them new things. And they'll be able to comfort others with the comfort they receive. We don't know. But I do believe that God saves the best for those who save the decision for him. And not try and take everything into your own hands and control every circumstance. Believe me, you can't. And you know that. You probably tried as I've tried in the past. Now God created Adam's helper before the fall. There was no implication that she was subject to him. She was just a partner, a companion. They were one. And the idea is she was to be his helper. And I want to reiterate this again because it's an important point. Because women sometimes have said to me, I'm not his helper. Actually, they've said that. But when you look at the gospel, John, Jesus says, I'll ask my father, he'll give you another helper that he may be with you forever. The Holy Spirit is a helper. Same word. A helper to help you become everything that God would have you be. 
Why? Genesis 2, 24 says this, For this reason man shall leave his father, his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one in flesh. And it's more than, again, as I mentioned earlier, just flesh. When people walk in, I know those that are, that are one. And I'm going to add flesh and spirit because you'll find it all through the Bible. They were to help one another, become all that God would have them be. Ephesians 5.25 says that husbands love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Peter doesn't call husbands just to love their wives. When you begin understanding, he wants them to demonstrate that love. I've known a lot of men that say they love their wife, but they've never shown that love to them. Everything that we're looking at today is showing love to your wife. One of the ways that you show love, demonstrate that love. See, words are simply not enough. It's not mere words that Peter is looking for here. It's the demonstration of a husband's love. I mentioned earlier without showing you the verse, Mark 3, 24, or 25, excuse me. Notice what it says, if a house is divided against itself, the house will not be able to stand. If you're struggling in your relationship, you need to decide you're going to stand. Because if you're not standing together as one, not giving to one another, submitting to one another, you are dividing that house. It's only a matter of time. You're torturing yourself. You're torturing each other. And the world is watching. What kind of Christian is that? especially when the statistics in the church are just as high as the world for divorce. The final verse today is from Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 and 10. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, the one will lift up the other companion, but woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift them up. Your wife is your companion. Your husband is your companion. Maybe you're single today. How does that apply to me? You have brothers and sisters here that will come along and they will lift you up. They will lift you up into the presence of God.